Judith, it is really great to be with you. I've admired your career. It's great to meet you personally. I think the audience feels the same way. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Well, let's start. The book is such an authentic extension of your personal narrative. Could you talk a little bit about how you first started working on the idea of resilience and outside of the institutional context, what was going on in your mind where you came to this realization about how important not only resilience, but the resilience dividend was to our society, if not the broader civilization? Well, I'm a psychologist, and I really began early, think, early in my career thinking about this concept because we worked on issues of coping strategies, who succeeded and who didn't, uh, and what kinds of coping strategies were most effective, how feelings of control and predictability started to really impact people's successful outcomes, whether it was psychological outcomes or health outcomes. We didn't call it resilience then, but it really was the underpinnings of a lot of what later became psychological theory and resilience, for example, we, we did work on children who came from equally disadvantaged backgrounds and 90% of them sort of wound up as we would expect in prison, out of school and the like. But 10% of them succeeded amazingly beyond all mm -hmm. expectations and um, we studied what it would be and, and, and how they would do it. At that time we really looked at it as a potential personality trait. Is this just something people are born with? And at the end of this work and a message in this book is that it isn't an inherited trait. It is a skill and a skill that can be taught and developed. And one of the reasons I wrote that book was, was to make that point and to really demonstrate the characteristics mm -hmm. that need to be built. Um, and there are five, and we'll talk about those mm -hmm. in order to, to um, build resilient people and institutions, businesses, and cities and, and societies. And I was so privileged when I got to Penn um, to have the opportunity to really work with our neighbors to transform mm -hmm. an extraordinarily disadvantaged uh, neighborhood, West Philadelphia, around the university. And we really came to understand that building resilience is a bottom-up process. It's about building community trust and cohesion. It's about building all of the elements of institution, uh, from individuals to institutions, um, that enable communities and cities to move forward together. And um, as you know, I also wrote a book on that, um, Out of the Ivory Tower and Into the Streets, really looking at the role of and the obligation of urban universities to re-engage with their communities so that everybody is transformed effectively. When you were leading Penn and engaging the community in this effort, was the concept of resilience ever on your mind? Were you um, making those connections between your work in psychology and the, the kinds of things that you saw that could be taught or learned or processed in a way that would help you in that role within the broader Philadelphia context? Um, not in the beginning. My response was a response that is so often the response when something bad happens to try to figure out how to recover from it. So my second month as president, a student, a graduate student was murdered in the neighborhood. And um, as in all thinking about disaster recovery and responding and how resilience started to figure mm -hmm. into all of this, we sprung into emergency action, which immediately meant more policing, less students on the street, mm -hmm. Um, all of the things that are, are our typical responses in reaction right, to crime. Right. And we sat back and took stock of ourselves mm -hmm. and the neighborhood and really asked about whether there could be a new way. Could mm -hmm. we, as an extraordinary institution with such powerful resources, both financial and person resources mm -hmm. and knowledge, do something that would really fundamentally change the narrative about crime, about communities, about the obligation 
of an urban institution. And so we developed a strategy with and for the neighborhood um, that uh, had five parts to it. Extraordinary economic development. We used Wharton, our business school, to help businesses in the neighborhood create businesses or become intermediaries that would build economic development into the neighborhood. For example, we owned five hospitals and we were sending all our hospital laundry all over Philadelphia. So we built a large community-based laundry, which now is the largest laundry in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and they took first our five hospitals. And so how do you create multiple wins for the same investment? And that is a fundamental concept of the resilience mm -hmm. dividend. We renovated housing, but we bought large tracts of housing to keep it affordable and in fact bless our trustees we used our own money to do a lot of that because nobody believed that West Philadelphia was fixable. And we sold a lot of those uh, renovated and rebuilt houses back to the community at a lower price than what we bought them at so that we wouldn't be gentrifying. We really would put teeth into the notion that you wanted to be a diverse mm -hmm. and, and, and really well-developed uh, kind of social uh, community and integration and diversity is another set of concepts around resilience. So I was learning as we were going, right. the labels came later. As you'll see from reading the book, there's a foundation of authenticity, I think, from your experiences into this now more critical area in many ways of thinking about how our urban environments can sustain themselves and be better. So let's talk about the nature of the problems first that have concerned you most to which the resilience dividend is a response. So tell us a little bit about how you see the major trends of our time in respect to the things that, are, that you worry about. Fast forward to the present time. I'm so grateful to be at Rockefeller where we really have the resources to see problems and figure out how to fix them and bring partners uh, with other kinds of resources to do that. Um, I, I think the stark reality is that at, at this moment, and I think for a long time going forward, crisis is the new normal. There really isn't a week that goes by that somewhere in the world we don't see a violent storm or a cyber attack or an economic blow or some kind of natural disaster. Is that because there's more crisis or because we're now more keyed in or aware of the crisis? I think there are three colliding trends that are actually accelerating the likelihood of, of crisis. Climate change, mm -hmm. globalization, the interconnectedness. Look at the epidemic spreads that mm -hmm. we worry right. about now that we never would have 40 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and urbanization. And so as you have, uh, we're starting to move towards 9 billion people on the planet, 2 billion more. Most of them will be in cities. Most of those cities around the world are on degraded ecologies, uh, coastal uh, areas that are problematic or river deltas, mm -hmm. because of course that's where cities typically locate. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's all of these trends, the, the globalization, uh, challenge, I think, that we saw in the, the interconnectedness challenge, both in the spreads of new kinds of infectious diseases. Fifty years ago, we didn't have disease that jumped from animals to humans. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have an escalating amount of new disease, but that new disease spreads mm -hmm. violently and rapidly um, around the world. As you look at globalization and urbanization in particular, is there also a glass half full dimension of that? That is, you talk a lot about integration and also urbanization means concentrations of people in mm -hmm. one place, which is in some ways ecologically sounder. Maybe it doesn't address the kinds of problems that you're thinking. Is there a, is there a hidden advantage in globalization and urbanization for our future. Of course, these two are marvelous forces for good and we've already seen the economic gains, the prosperity, as you say, environmental benefits when people are densely packed right, into cities right. in terms of the utilization of resources. But even there, there's great vulnerability. 
Um, we're sitting in Los Angeles where water issues uh, are as much a concern as seismic activity. Um, and so if there were fewer people sharing those resources, obviously, right, right. Um, there wouldn't be as much pressure. Well, I hope we get to your impressions of Los Angeles. I'd love to get a resilient score for Los Angeles. <laughs> but before we get there, oh, let's... Oh, you will get let, one. Let, let's... You uh, will get one. So in <laughs> all sincerity, if I may interrupt, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as part of our centennial last year, we ran a challenge uh, for 100 resilient cities around the world. And uh, we picked the first 33, and Los Angeles is among the first 33. Uh, yay. And um, Los Angeles has appointed a chief resilience officer, which the Rockefeller Foundation is paying for in each of the 100 cities. But the first part of the work that any city does will be actually scoring itself on a resilience index. Mm. And then as it develops a strategy and the investments are made and the wonderful changes we're expecting occur, we will keep re-rating mm -hmm. on that index. So you guys will know where you stand. All right, so in order <laughs> to get the score right, we have to learn something about resilience now. So tell us about the five elements of resilience that you write about in your book. So there are five characteristics and I'm going, if I may, um, since this is supposed to be a business talk, um, give you an exa a business failure example of each one, okay. um, just to make it clear. The first characteristic is awareness, uh, really being able in real time to know what's happening and respond to it. So situations change quickly, data and evidence comes quickly. Heightened levels of awareness is the first characteristic. So if you look at the, the um, target breach and the enormous impact that it had last Thanksgiving, there was very little awareness of how vulnerable they were. And in fact, a couple of months ago, Verizon Enterprise Solutions did a large survey of American businesses and they found only 31% of all companies could self-identify a breach and only 5% of retailers could self-identify a breach. So think of that the next time you take out your credit card. Mm -hmm. Awareness. The second is diversity or redundancy. Um, and they're really important, uh, another important characteristic to have uh, diverse elements which bring both diverse perspectives and also add strength mm -hmm. through diversity, but redundancy so that you can fall back if one thing fails. So a classic business example is Lululemon. Um, many of you will remember the Lululemon sheer yoga pants catastrophe. Well, they relied on one textile manufacturer who supplied one source of fiber, Luan. And so when it was found to be wanting, they had no redundancy in their system to fall back on. It's a mm -hmm. tremendous vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So, and lots of suppliers now are really rethinking their global supply chain. In an effort to um, reduce costs, there became a business trend called real-time supply chain. That's a very maladaptive, it's a non-resilient strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, the third characteristic is integrated. Mm -hmm. So the ability to share information quickly, that there is transparency, that kind of the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. And the after action reports that are coming out on General Motors show how badly <laughs> integrated they are, that one division didn't know what another division was doing, one unit within a division didn't know what another unit was mm. doing, and so that lack of integration was one of the mm. elements of their vulnerability. The, th uh, the fourth characteristic is self-regulation. So the ability to de-network, to island something if something goes wrong, mm. so that you can fail safely rather than catastrophically. Mm. And a great example of this is that energy companies are now putting in smart grid technology because a smart switch allows them, if one piece fails, mm -hmm. to not take, to de mm -hmm. really network and not take down the whole mm -hmm. system. So 
very important uh, element. And then the fifth characteristic is adaptability, the ability to be nimble and flexible, to change in real time, um, and to benefit from, to grow, and to revitalize through that adaptation process. Again, a very cool business example uh, is Best Buy. Um, Best Buy uh, used to be called The Sound of Music. It was in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And in 1981, it was ravaged by, uh, their stores were ravaged by a terrible tornado. 25% of all businesses never recover after a disaster, so adaptiveness is a critical characteristic. Um, what they did was throw out their entire model, which was stores and counters and sales, high pressure salespeople and home delivery. They put out big tents, because after all their stores had been destroyed, opened all their inventory, slashed prices to rock bottom. Two years later, seeing how successful it was, they changed their name to Best Buy. And they are now, of course, one of the largest electronics mm. retailers mm. retail in the world. And they've used that adaptive strategy to weather other storms. The threat of competition, online competition like Amazon. Again, they're adapting, and you can see it, mm -hmm. as they've evolved mm -hmm. over all of these years. So these are critical characteristics. You can see features of them in businesses that succeed and in businesses that don't do well. Are these five elements at the heart of your scorecard for evaluating resilient cities? Yes, all those characteristics are there and cities are going to be evaluated on four domains, hard and soft infrastructure, leadership, community prosperity, community cohesion, the fabric and well-being of community, and then livelihoods and economic capacity. And in the context of cities, are there any tensions between these characteristics? <laughs> So for example, diversity and integrated. Sounds like it could, it could produce a tension, but with a, perhaps a creative solution. How but, do you see that? But this? that's the answer, Hiram. Right. It is a creative solution. Right. Some of these do have tensions um, inherent in them, and there isn't one right solution. This isn't a cookbook. This is really a way to think about those characteristics and fit them to purpose. Okay. And so as we work with each of these cities, and LA has been a fabulous example, um, it's not that we're saying, okay, here's the cookbook, right. everybody has to do the same thing in the same way, and that's why every process starts with what we call an agenda setting workshop, where the city calls together um, a diversity of their stakeholders, mm -hmm. government officials, business leaders and representatives, um, NGO leaders and activists in the community. And often out of that agenda setting workshop, a very different framing, A, of what they want to work on, how they define their problems, their shocks mm -hmm. and stresses, and also the kinds of things that they think are most important mm -hmm. to build in these characteristics mm -hmm. as they are working on those four domains. So you're drawing on local knowledge to Critical. and local stakeholders and local context instead of just imposing from the East Coast some Definitely. recipe on cities that maybe folks at Rockefeller don't quite yet understand adequately. Well, and that's why we don't presume to tell them what to do. We're going to have 100 cities and we've had 800 applications from cities all over the world. So this is striking a chord everywhere. I mean, we've been blown away by the cities that have applied. I mean, in the Middle East, in, in places in Africa that are ravaged now by disease. It, I mean, both Monrovia and Freetown applied in this, in this round. Um, so, and, and wonderful cities that you think have tons of capacity already, like Rotterdam or uh, London. So this is resonating, but cities are the best, cities have the best knowledge of their cities. Right. And we want to use that local knowledge for two reasons. One, because it's obviously much more valid and, mm -hmm. and honest, and that's where they have to start their process. But also because for sustainability, sustainability we're trying to build capacity to leave behind. Right. Right. And that's this, only the cities can do that for themselves. So the program at Rockefeller is relatively new, right? I mean, you, you've only started this when? A couple of years ago? Well, this city, this 
initiative. We began 10 years ago. Okay. We, we were deeply engaged in New Orleans recovery after okay. Katrina. New Orleans is an amazing example of <laughs> lack of resilience, which made the Katrina um, situation so much worse. But it was a city that lacked resilient capacity way before the storm ever hit. Um, high levels of poverty, high levels of crime, uh, just uh, terrible municipal government, all kinds of things that really were very problematic. But now they are using the experience, next year will be 10 years, um, and they have used this recovery to not only recover and certainly not to build back the same. And one of the points I make over and over again in the book is that recovery is not any longer about building back the same. And we have all kinds of federal reimbursement guidelines indeed that force some communities to build back the same. New Orleans is revitalizing in completely new ways. They're changing their entire economic base. They took over all of their public schools and made them charter schools, a, a phenomenally interesting experiment um, and the only city to do it. They are reanimating and re-energizing their neighborhoods in really constructive ways. So there's such high levels of community cohesion and trust in ways we didn't see before. So it's been a 10-year journey for us. I want to come back to this very important notion of the added value. That's something greater than sustainability or enterprise risk management. But let's, let's put that off for a second. I want to ask you this question. You've been involved with cities all over the world. Are there any cross-cultural comparisons you could make about different propensities in different countries about how resilient they are? Are there particular places that do this well or poorly, in particular the United States? Would you say that you find the United States to be more or less resilient than what you find in other places? That's a very important question. We do not. Mm. We find a diversity of resilient cities in the U.S. And we find the same thing all across the world. And in a way, that's what's made this work so interesting. We've seen some amazingly resilient cities who have these five capacities in very, very poor countries. So it's not only about the material resources, the financial resources. It's, it's way more than that. And you know, we, we had a huge experience with this in New York in our own recovery from Superstorm Sandy. And I chaired the recovery commission for mm -hmm. Governor Cuomo. And we were determined to build, well, I was determined, and therefore the commission was <laughs> determined, to build in resilience characteristics in all elements of our recovery. So um, we have a very significant home buyout program for Da the most damaged houses that are in the most flood-prone areas, um, 321 homes in Staten Island have been bought by the state using recovery money. We've got, and this will resonate in an architecture building, um, we've got to change our paradigm, really, about water. We've got to learn how to live with water rather than pave and pipe and mm -hmm. pump which has been our traditional mm -hmm. paradigm. Mm -hmm. And so where the land will now be reclaimed because those houses have been destroyed and the, the homeowners have moved to less flood prone areas, um, natural estuaries will be reestablished. There'll be soft green infrastructure parks and recreation will mm -hmm. be developed. And all of the surrounding communities therefore will be protected um, from flooding and, and wave action in ways that were impossible before. So this is an important principle of adaptability. That Absolutely. is the ability to recognize forces outside your control and to go with them in a way, right? Not to always resist or fight them right. with a single design. You know, we, Rotterdam is one of our cities, mm -hmm. but Rotterdam has really learned how to live with water. And they've learned through both soft and hard infrastructure. So there are design principles here. Um, in one, we, we uh, some of you may know, and we're about to take this national, which I'd like to mention, but for the last billion dollars of recovery money that HUD had 
um, for the Sandy affected areas, we and HUD ran a competition called Rebuild by Design. And the purpose of the competition was to bring teams of architects and engineers and landscape architects and, and others um, in a global competition. And the criterion was you've got to build more resiliently and you've got to really engage the affected communities. This can't be about parachuting in the experts to figure out the best recovery design. And so one great example, one of the six winners um, is a project called the Big U that the BIG firm uh, led. And it's the, an, a 10 mile uh, storm surge barrier around lower Manhattan. But instead of just building a kind of concrete, ugly storm surge barrier, which was what the initial plan was when the first thoughts about recovery occurred, they integrated with the community and they developed extraordinary design features. And each community got something that they needed as part of the design. So one community is getting more bike paths and recreation space. Another community is getting really adaptable market space for outdoor markets, which will spur economic activity. A third one wanted it for art installations. So for one investment, five paybacks, that's the resilience dividend. I suppose in your process design, you got the people around the table who had that particular idea or input, without which you would have just had a big barrier. Exactly. Absolutely, and when the 10 finalist teams presented, what was most heartening, and we did it in a big open space and thousands of citizens mm -hmm. came um, just to hear and to see, which was wonderful. Um, what was most exciting to us was every presentation was made by the experts and the community members. So it was really, in the end, a shared project. I am convinced that those communities, and we're watching them and studying mm -hmm. them, are developing enormous amounts of cohesion and mm -hmm. trust and right. capacity as a result of that process. And so HUD liked this so much that there's another billion dollars that they get to spend on the 67 communities that have been declared around the whole United States that have been declared natural, have had declared natural disasters over the last three years. And we're running a national competition like this. So we're trying to get this notion of the triple wins that you can get by building more resiliently. But you know, Hiram, I raised the federal guidelines, the policy issues. So um, I, I'm reminded by the state of Vermont and they're participating in the national competition that in 2011, they were terribly uh, affected by Hurricane Irene. And there was tremendous flooding. And so they rebuilt their uh, calverts and, and protections uh, in the rivers and, and streams in a very innovative way with structures that bent and that were porous and that um, took in water quickly and released water more slowly. I mean, really innovative. They can't get reimbursed for, from FEMA because the Stafford Act is requiring that they had to build it back the same way. This is nutty. It's like government malpractice. So, so that's when restoration is revitalization negative. So, yeah. right? so let's get into your three R's because I want to get into the program. Tell us about the three big R's in your program. I've talked about the five characteristics, the three R's that need to be attended to and, and why we think there needs to be a paradigm shift because the first one is readiness, preparing. We can't always look in the rear view mirror preparing for the last crisis. And this realization came to me really in chairing the, the State Sandy Commission because after 9-11, so many of the businesses downtown put their generators in the basement because the next attack, of course, was gonna come from the air. And then in Sandy, they all got flooded. So this is not preparedness for a specific crisis, right. but preparedness for any crisis. And I really need to give a kind of sister city example to LA, and that's San Francisco. San Francisco has amazing preparedness. And they 
aren't just preparing for the next earthquake, which they are positive will happen, and it's just a question of when. Mm -hmm. But their preparedness exercises will make them, and they're doing this intentionally, mm -hmm. will make them ready for the next storm or a terrorist attack or anything. They're integrating the entire business community in all of the planning efforts, and so PG&E, their cable companies, their communications media, mm -hmm. Uh, transportation are all part of in an integrated way of the city's preparation for anything that could go wrong they're taking advantage of the emerging sharing economy businesses in the Bay Area Airbnb Uber mm -hmm. Lyft because they define resilience they're about how you use excess capacity in really creative ways They've, they're using Fleet Week, which used to be you know, an annual bar crawl mm -hmm. in San Francisco, now as emergency preparedness practice sessions with their citizens. <laughs> and it's an amazing thing to watch. For those communities that are, say, less evolved than San Francisco <laughs> or any organization, looking out at the variety of risks and crises, it can be overwhelming. And it's also hard to know which thing is going to occur and how much energy to invest in any one particular area. What advice would you give to an organization that perhaps is unresilient or non-resilient and is looking out at the world knowing that there'll be an earthquake at some point, knowing that there'll be fires, knowing that there'll be a, sh a live shooter, knowing that there are other types of crises or risks, how, what advice could you give to, to an organization or to a leader in that particular type of so situation. So the example that I just gave refers to any crisis. So they are spending some appropriate time thinking about a specific crisis, particularly earthquakes and uh, worrying about the soft story buildings as you are here in LA and the like. So they're not ignoring the highest risks, right. but the kind of preparedness that I just talked about doesn't require defining which risk it will be. It's an integrated set of responses for any crisis. And that's the critical point of building resilience. So, so that's the, brilliant. You build a core of exactly. responsiveness that is adaptable to the crisis. That's the point. Okay. So that's the preparedness part. Okay. Recovery I've already talked about a bit, okay. that you can't recover the same way um, we can no longer rebuild, literally or figuratively, that which we just saw was vulnerable uh, in the last event. So new design, new ways of thinking, uh, new kinds of, of uh, ideas around all of the elements of how we recover when something bad hits. And then revitalization is so the third R, that we the revitalization has to begin in the recovery process. You can't wait until afterwards because otherwise you're taking actions in recovery that may actually prevent effective kinds of revitalization. So it isn't, it, it isn't trite to say a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We want to try to avoid them, but if it happens, it needs to be used as a mechanism for revitalization. and. We see all kinds of businesses, as I gave Best Buy example, all kinds of communities around the world doing that. Is there a psychological dimension to the notion in a crisis that we won't only recover, we will be better? Does that have a motivation or does it motivate the community to, to really remoralize themselves? To get to step up to the tremendous challenge of recovery, but with the ambition to add that extra value to yeah, it are. does. I think the the most recent example many of us have seen, and I, I talk about it in the book, is the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombings. Because the a, immediate narrative after that was Boston strong, and they told themselves a story about who they were and what their capacity was and what they were going to do going forward. And it's very compelling, and I quote some of the editorials in the newspapers and how people really talked about, you know, they're not gonna knock us down, we're gonna stand up and we're gonna change and we're gonna recover better than ever. 
and they are making themselves different. And they're focusing now in a very, they were also quite prepared. Mm -hmm. No one who got to a hospital in those bombings died because everyone got to a hospital who was alive within 17 minutes. And that was because they, again, had extraordinary preparation. They had decided in these integrated preparedness exercises that um, the FBI was always going to be the lead agency no matter what went wrong, if it was terrorism, if it was a flood, if it was a nor'easter. So everybody knew who was on first. They decided that Deval Patrick was going to be the communicator and continuously communicate with the public. No, no mayor, no police chief, no, he was there and they all knew that he was on first. So you can see again in this preparedness, the recovery was so much quicker. Resilience is about preparing for disruption building the kind of capacity that allows you to rebound more quickly and more effectively, mm -hmm. and then this capacity to grow and adapt. So let's talk about the dividend. I mean, it would have been enough for you to write a book called Resilience, but you added the resilience dividend, that there's something else down the line of this investment that produces an enormous return. Tell us about how you came up with that concept and what it means to you. So the concept really reveals two principles. The first is that the investments do allow you to rebound more safely and effectively because you can't predict or prepare for every crisis. So the goal here is to manage the avoidable and avoid the unmanageable and therefore to kind of bounce back more effectively. So that's one piece of the dividend. But the second piece, and this emerged in the work, this was not a notion that I had before that is that if you make these kinds of investments that we've been talking about, it yields benefit in the good times too. Mm -hmm. So you really are getting more bang for the buck. So a few examples, um, much greater social cohesion. I've talked about the kind of community capacity mm -hmm. that's built when you do this. So you have lots of community trust, lots of good things happening in the good times. Lots of goods and services are emerging from those investments that are building economic capacity back into cities in new and different ways. Mm -hmm. So think for a moment about the characteristics that I talked about. Um, big data analytics allowing awareness. It, it's what they are there for. And so lots of use of new jobs and new kinds of services in cities that are incorporating that. Um, new kinds of sensing mechanisms from the Internet of Things creating awareness and also uh, adaptability. Uh, 3D printing, which is an amazing resilience kind of company. We saw a company after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines last year that 3D printed housing, relief housing, out of the debris from the typhoon within 24 hours. You know, we're sitting there waiting for FEMA trailers. So it's, it's an amazing thing mm -hmm. to see these kinds of new goods and services. Mm -hmm. And so we worry about new growth models in the United mm -hmm. States. Resilience building does that. Or I'll give you a classic one, you know, back to my Sandy recovery stories, but again, it shows it so clearly. So one of the designs that came out of the rebuild by design for Hoboken um, will show the resilience dividend. So they have tremendous flooding, even when it's not a super storm. They also have very little parking space and virtually no green recreational space. So the rebuild, is doing underground parking garages that are using a Dutch engineering technology that will make them water overflow tanks in mm -hmm. times of flooding. And the surface, the top surface, is all greened for bike paths and new recreation. Three wins, one investment, that's the resilience dividend. To what extent, we've been talking about, and your book focuses on major disruptions, uh, natural disasters, uh, all kinds of things that happen to communities with these very strong external forces. 
Is there any room for thinking about resilience uh, as applied to the chronic problems? Yeah. Uh, we have 38,000 automobile deaths a year. We have 10 million felony crimes in our country every year. We still have vast pockets of hunger and poverty in the country. How would you apply a resilience dividend model to those chronic human conditions in our society? One of the things that the index and that will uh, tell each city what it will be working on does is it focuses on the largest likely shocks and the slow burning chronic stresses. And so inequity, traffic congestion, poor air quality or poor water quality. Does that sound familiar? Right, well I, I didn't pick random ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, all, all come into thinking here. But let me give you an amazing example. We didn't do this, um, but this was done and it, it so graphically shows on the slow burning stresses mm -hmm. what a resilience mm -hmm. mindset can do. Um, many of us remember the city of Medellin, Colombia, and it was the drug capital of the world 15 years ago, crime ridden, people were leaving in droves. There's a museum to the disappeared because so many people were killed or disappeared during that time period. And Medellin tried all of the traditional mechanisms, more police on the streets, militias, army, it, and the drug traffic got worse and worse. And a, a very creative mayor and group of, of uh, civic leaders decided they were totally non-resilient. The city was breaking apart. Mm -hmm. And they were going to try a completely, trans a completely different strategy. And so for those of you who know Medellin, it's, it's big hills and then a valley floor. And all of the rich people and all of the economic activity are on the valley floor and all the favelas and all the drug traffic were in the surrounding hills. So Medellin built a transportation system that has a metro on the flat floor, and then going up into the hills, they have gondolas, like we see in the US at, at, at ski resorts. Mm -hmm. And at each of those gondola stops, they put community centers and health clinics and schools. And they started connecting the most disadvantaged communities to the social fabric down below and also offering services. They still couldn't connect all the communities, so they built escalators into the hills like we see in shopping malls. And those escalators then take people into the most inaccessible places. Crime is down 90% in Medellin. Social cohesion is extraordinary. It's not that they don't have problems but they are such a transformed city and society. I hadn't known what they had done and they were one of the applicants for the 100 resilient cities and they told us their story. And it is a story of how you confront a slow burning stress like crime and inequality and drug traffic in a new frame of thinking and, and really do yield the resilience mm. dividend. Wonderful. In 10 years, how will the Rockefeller Foundation know that it succeeded? What are the, what are the metrics that you're thinking about for the future in this program, and, and will you continue it? Right. So I'm an empirical social scientist. So of course, we're measuring like crazy. Um, we have baseline data on all of the cities, and we will on all of these uh, characteristics and features that will be identified through the index. Mm -hmm. And then we have a variety of near-term and shorter and uh, longer-term measures. So we're paying for the chief resilience officers for each of the cities for three years. One measure of success for us is whether the city then picks up that salary afterwards. This is an innovative position. The role is to integrate across all of the silos in city government and to connect city government with all of the other elements of society and civil society and business and the like. Um, it's a very revolutionary concept. Some cities are already sort of figuring it out, but a lot of the chief resilience officers are already bumping up into against the traditional silos. Mm -hmm. And so how engaged are the mayors and the like or other kinds of measures. But we will measure, are measuring, community cohesion, 
reduction in crime, improvement in education, leadership variables of one sort or another, economic development. Um, we think uh, all of these metrics are readily accessible, and we've been working with uh, Arup, the uh, global firm, to actually develop very micro indicators of all of these variables, and we'll share them with the cities. Well, this is a profound contribution to our society. I think we're going to open it up for questions. I'm Lori from the Colburn School in Los Angeles. I'm wondering if um, the foundation, or if in your book, if you address the resilience dividend in terms of organizations. I do. First of all, businesses are organizations, but I talk about a variety of kinds of organizations and institutions in the book because I am absolutely certain that this applies as readily to an individual, to an organization, to a city, to a society. And so I tried to sample in the book a variety of examples that would really make that point. Hi, I'm Anjali from the United Talent Agency Foundation. Um, I was curious if you could share some insights from the resilience report for Los Angeles. Um, were there any things that you thought were particularly good or particularly bad? Well, I think Los Angeles is, is defining itself, and so there's no rating system that says whether it's good or bad. It merely defines what the issues are, where you are, and then what are the most important things in building a strategy um, to evolve to a better place. So uh, we, don't, we try not to label it as a good or a bad practice, but rather to talk about how what we see on the ground and what the communities are seeing themselves on the ground can be transformational if they build these resilience characteristics into their approaches in the first iteration that makes tremendous sense because of course you don't want to come in with some very negative series of judgments at some point does it become an evaluative process in which you give a scorecard and yeah. you're saying you're doing really well or not so well here or there the second piece of this after the agenda setting workshop is that we fund a strategy development process which usually takes between six and nine months and the city will then develop its own strategy. At that point, the third amazing feature of this kicks in, um, and that is the cities get access to a platform of goods and services depending on what their strategies are. So we have many private sector companies on the platform. Palantir is doing big data analytics. They're in LA already working from that platform. Uh, on dashboards for the cities. Swiss Re is develop using their CatNet technology, but is also about to develop um, uh, municipal catastrophe bonds for our cities. Uh, a consortium of banks is about to put together a new kind of resilience infrastructure financing structure for the cities. And then there's lots of, of NGOs. The Nature Conservancy is on the platform offering all kinds of wetland and, and river uh, water restoration uh, projects. Sandia National Laboratories, this was so cool. I, I launched this and I was on Morning Joe last year in our centennial and I launched it. And the director of Sandia National Laboratories, which is a very esoteric national government finance set of research laboratories around risk. Um, called and said, you know, our scientists never get to do anything practical. They're all in the lab and they're brilliant. And, but they would love to be consultants for the cities because they're really experts. So now Sandy is working with Norfolk um, on and helping them assess the risk of doing things and the risk of not doing things so that they can create a more evolved strategy. So we will then evaluate, because they have access to such amazing resources, how effectively they use the resources, are they really committed to changing. They're not going to be able to say, we don't know how, or we don't know what, or we don't have resources of one sort or another, and then the evaluation starts. Well, it's brilliant to create a condominium of shared expertise and also to reduce the cost of each city exactly. doing this all on its own. That's stunning. Other questions? 
beyond the substantial assets of the Rockefeller Foundation and beyond some of these corporate uh, contributions and foundation contributions you talk about, how is all this really being paid for? Where are the hard dollars coming from? So we've committed $100 million, and so far the platform partners have committed $100 million. Um, the IFC is putting together, the International Finance Corporation, is putting together a multi-billion dollar loan fund for the cities in the developing world because they will need investable capital for the infrastructure, for some of the infrastructure projects. And then we have uh, global banks uh, for the developed world cities. Um, it is our estimate, and we've done work here uh, in particular, uh, we finance the development of the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange, which is a collaboration among California, Oregon, uh, Washington, and British Columbia to bring private capital to public infrastructure projects. We see such success doing that in Canada and in Australia, and we see a lot of private capital sitting on the sidelines waiting for American states and cities to develop an ROI, develop a capital budget, develop a long-term planning scenario. And part of these processes is to help them do that and develop a series of infrastructure exchanges that will not only make public finance more effective, but will crowd in private investment. Hi, so very compelling conversation and thesis. To the extent you have, um, you've run into objections or resistance in um, your programming, where do they come from and on what basis do you run into those objections? Are they uh, political, philosophical, economic? Can you comment on that? Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> so um, in the first cohort of cities, uh, I think it sounded like such a good idea and everybody who, you know, many of the cities who applied thought, well, how could this be bad? We're going to get all this free money and we're going to get a chief resilience officer and blah, blah, and blah. And they didn't realize that when the rubber hit the road, they would really have to do stuff like break down the silos of government, truly listen to their citizens, interact with uh, private business in ways that may feel uncomfortable unless you're regulating them. Um, and for some of the cities, that's been quite difficult. And I must say that in the second round, and we're about to announce the second round of cities in Singapore in December, we've, had, we've come into all of the finalist cities and had what we call looking in the whites of your eyes conversations, because we really want to make sure they know what they're signing on for. Um, these are fundamental changes in the way cities operate. And they need to really understand that and, and be able to deliver on it. Hi, I'm Tyler. I'm a student at Claremont McKenna. Um, my question is about uh, the types of challenges that organizations or institutions face. Um, and when I think about our college or many other organizations like it, I see fewer challenges to infrastructure and more challenges that kind of degrade the emotional well-being mm -hmm. of an institutional organization. What sorts of recommendations do you have to mitigate the effects of challenges like those? Well, hopefully you've heard in this conversation m more than about infrastructure. But infrastructure isn't only about buildings or coastal wetland restoration. Infrastructure is about the infrastructure of a community which is about trust and is about cohesion and is about adaptability. And those are such critical characteristics that need to exist on a college campus. And um, a lot of things that happen break down those elements of trust or they pit one element of the community against one another. And I think one of the roles, one of the privileges, and I, I think Hiram will agree, of being a university president is to develop a more resilient community. Uh, I was president of Penn during 9-11, and um, that night, as we talked about what had happened and what the geopolitical forces were that were really driving 
behaviors like this. Um, we held a candlelight vigil on campus. And I said to the Penn students, I was an undergraduate during the Vietnam War. And we thought we could change the world. And we did. And so go out tonight and figure out how you can change the world to build cohesion, to build more diverse and integrated social fabric at this institution. I learned, and I didn't tell them what to do. I learned the next day that a huge group of the Jewish students went to visit the dorm rooms of the Muslim and Arab students and just reach out and say, we're all Penn students and you know, we have to figure out our friendships. And it was pretty amazing for me as president to learn that the next day. We picked intentionally in our first cohort of cities, Ramallah, Palestine, and Ashkelon, Israel. And I was so pleased at the Chief Resilience, first Chief Resilience Officer Summit that we had last week, um, that those two Chief Resilience Officers were sitting together. And you know, if we can build resilience that bridges differences, that builds trust, that develops understanding, we will build capacities in our institutions that will make them able to endure anything, and they will be stronger in the good times. We'll do two more questions. Hi, my name is um, Irena Davis Ferguson. I'm actually a Yale Divinity uh, wow. graduate of 2010. <laughs> and my question is, what did you learn in New Haven? Like, what did you learn about resilience in New Haven? It's such a loaded question. But. <laughs> That's a very tough question. I was. Well, I was there for 22 years. I loved Yale and being on the Yale faculty, and it, it contributed to so much of, of who I am and, and how I've succeeded. Um, I, I, this, here's the answer that I think will please you. In the second round of applications, so normally each city applies separately. In the second round of applications, we had a triple joint application from Stamford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. And they asked for only one chief resilience officer who would report to all three mayors as a way of finally trying to have Connecticut figure out how to be a more integrated, more resilient set of communities. And I am so pleased and proud because that is very different than what I experienced when I was there. And our final question. Hi, I'm Kira. I'm a student also at Claremont McKenna College. And my question is about the future of the Resilience Initiative. Do you, or I guess, does the Rockefeller Foundation and its partners see the future of this initiative as going deeper into the cities, infiltrating not only the public institutions, but the local businesses, the community groups? Or do you see it spreading like wildfire across the world? What's the future of that? Initiative. You know, that's, that's such an important question because we're still asking ourselves that question. We will be in all of the segments of that city's society in the three years we're working with each city. But we are now asking ourselves, should we stay in those hundred and go deeper beyond the three years, or should we try to spread it? The good news is that the spreading may happen naturally and they may not need us. One of the things we've seen that's been so phenomenal is that in the first agenda setting workshops, we've seen mayors invite lots of other mayors from their country to just come and learn from the process. And we think that's really cool because it will spread. What we're trying to do is create a movement. We're worried about the future and we think we need a more resilient world. And maybe this can start to spearhead because we see all the innovation and creativity from the ground up, both in communities and in cities rather than in national governments, including especially our own. Um, and so we hope that in seeding these ideas, we really are seeding a movement that will take hold and we'll just sit back and be proud parents. It's an extremely insightful book. Judith Roden, is an inspiring leader, and this project is a profoundly impactful one. And I want to thank you on behalf of thank all of so us much. for being here. Thank you.